sponsor will now introduce um, Christina Canati, and here's Shirin Mataram. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Konati on behalf of McGraw-Hill Education. Um, I was going through Dr. Konati's um, bio this morning, and I was very impressed and um, got excited about having this privilege to introduce her. So um, Christina uh, received her master's in computer science, as well as another master's and PhD in intelligence systems at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, she has done um, extensive research to integrate re um, in research on artificial intelligence, human-computer interaction, and, compu and cognitive science to create intelligent interactive systems that can dynamically adapt to individual user needs. Her areas of interest and, um, include um, educational data mining and intelligent tutoring systems. She's done extensive work on these areas and has over 100 uh, peer-reviewed publications in these fields. Um, she's received multiple awards from different organizations and venues, including user modeling and user adaptive interaction, and also ACM transactions on um, intelligent interactive systems. Um, she is um, currently an associate editor for multiple journals and conferences, including Journal of Artificial Intelligence in Education. And um, she serves as a president of Association for the Advancement of, uh, of Effective Computing, as well as program chair and um, conference chair for several international conferences, including educational data mining and artificial in uh, intelligence in education. Um, um, I'm really excited to hear about her talk today. She's going to tell us about how user in individual differences uh, can impact visualization processing and um, how uh, this could be captured uh, using predictive models that are built based on eye tracking data and how we could leverage these uh, models to provide personalized support such that um, we could improve, improve users' experience with visualizations. Um, I was at multiple uh, presentations yesterday about dashboard design and visual visualizations, and I'm sure this will be of interest um, for a lot of us. Um, Dr. Konati, please uh, welcome. Uh, so thanks, uh, um, the organizer. Thank you, the organizer, for uh, inviting me here today for uh, Shirin's kind invitation and to all of you for attending the talk. Um, I see this is a great opportunity to uh, present some of this work. So as Shirin mentioned, I've done a lot of research in the fields of uh, intelligent tutoring systems, educational data mining. The work that I'll present today is not uh, as strictly related yet to those fields, um, but I really hope that after the talk, there will be ideas from this community to take on some of the things that I am going to say and see if we can actually apply some of these ideas to a more educational setting. So I'm really excited of being here, so thanks again. Um, so uh, as uh, just rephrasing uh, a little bit what uh, Shirin said, uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context for my general research, which is in uh, user adaptive interaction, which is uh, a interdisciplinary fields that brings together research in artificial intelligence, human computer interaction, cognitive science with the goal of creating intelligent interfaces that are capable of providing a more personalized experience to their users by being able to track and capture um, user states, needs, preferences that might be relevant for personalization and adapt the interaction accordingly. Obviously, in order to be able to adapt to user traits, it's very important to be able to capture these relevant properties, and that's done in what's called, the structure is called the user model. And uh, there's been work on uh, capturing and tracking things as varied as users' goals, knowledge, behavior regularities, 
preferences and even more esoteric things such as emotions, cognitive load, personality. Uh, obviously the tricky part is how to be able to infer these properties of the user from possibly limited information that you get from the interaction with the target uh, system. So people have been looking at leveraging, leveraging as many sources as they can um, have available, including traditional um, action events and action logs, but also looking at more sophisticated kind of input, including speech, gesture, body movements, and I have dots in all these boxes because I'm just listing some of the items that are relevant there. Uh, the whole point is, once you have this information about the user, what can we do with it? As I said, the, the goal is to try to personalize the interaction, help the user get a more personalized interactive experience based on what has been um, collected in the user model about the user. And some forms of personalizations, uh, just to give you some examples, include, for instance, uh, giving help on tasks, which is very uh, common, for instance, in intelligent tutoring systems, uh, but also, for instance, change the layout uh, and widgets in the interface so that the interface itself, the shape of the interface is more suitable for the specific user's characteristics. Uh, tailor how the information, the content of the interface is presented to best suit the current user, recommend objects, and the list continues. Um, in order to devise a user adaptive system or interface, there are three main steps. There's not the only steps, but these are the three initial steps that need to be uh, engaged and need to be taken in order to understand how to best build your user adaptive interactivity. Um, so first, it's important to understand which user characteristics have an actual impact on the user experience with a specific interactive system. Um, some of these might be intuitive. For instance, if you have an intelligent tutoring system, you probably want, you know, you know that student's knowledge is going to have an impact on how the student works with the system. Others might be not as obvious. For instance, we know that emotions might be relevant in an educational interaction. However, which emotions might be relevant is a little bit more difficult to know a priori. So it's important to investigate what are the user properties that are actually important to personalize. Uh, so this is answering the question, what do we want to adapt to? Um, it's also important to try and understand how the characteristics that have been found to be relevant in step one actually affect users' performance because we want to see if we can understand um, why this impact happens and which behaviors are affected by these characteristics because they could become points where we want to focus our adaptation. So the second step helps understand how to provide adaptation. And then, obviously, because we want to be able to, does this work, I guess? Uh, we want to be able to um, build models that can track this information about the user in real time and react to it. We need to ascertain that we can actually build these predictive models in real time based on the available data to be able to understand when it's important to provide adaptation during the interaction. And uh, so research in user adaptive interaction has been around for a long time. Now it's picking up again because of this new enthusiasm about AI. But definitely, you know, uh, example of user adaptive um, systems include recommender systems, intelligent tutoring systems. There are now a lot of applications that are researched in the field of smart home entertainment, so intelligent um, games. Uh, assistive, assistive technologies, and so on and so forth. Um, a field where there has not been as much interest in looking at user adaptive um, techniques is that of information visualization. Um, and it's interesting because information uh, visualizations are becoming uh, more and more prominent in our daily lives, not only in professional settings where they might have been always quite important, but also in our personal lives with more and more personal data being tracked by all these devices that are created to help us and make more aware of what we do while we live. And so there's all this data, it's often needed to be visualized to us. Um, and 
it's spending my day yesterday at various sessions, I see that these visualizations are very important for this community as well. So there is a lot of interest in dashboard learning dashboards. Yesterday we heard about we heard about open learner models, which might not be as um, has been extensively worked on in this community, but it's definitely something that you know it's creating visualizations for learners to see what's happening to them as they're working with an, with a tutoring system. Um, and the interesting thing is, so visualizations are becoming used by an uh, increasingly large variety of populations and users. Um, but in information visualization, the common practice is still designing visualizations with a one-size-fits-all approach in terms of users. So obviously, the InfoVis people, they look at the data that need to be visualized, at the tasks that the visualization needs to support, but there hasn't been so far a lot of interest in looking at individual differences. And that's a shame because there is evidence, increasing evidence that these individual differences matter, okay? Now I'm gonna show you a lot of text. You don't have to read all the text, just focus on the red stuff. This is sort of the initial evidence starting back from, you know, even like uh, late 80s, that things such as preferences, user preferences, domain expertise, uh, and some cognitive abilities such as spatial and perceptual abilities can impact how users work with specific visualizations. And there's even work showing that a personality trait known as locus of control can impact how users work with visualizations. Locus of control is a trait that essentially measures how much you think you are in control of your own circumstances as opposed to the outside world is in charge and you have no hope to do anything about it. Um, and so there's you know, several papers that have tried uh, to control for this uh, personality trait. I've seen that it does have an impact on how users work with visualizations, which I, I would have never thought. So that was surprising to me. But anyways, um, because of the importance of individual differences and the fact that user populations that are going to be facing visualizations is increasing, there is definitely great need and potential for personalization. Okay, to take the user into account much more than this current one-size-fits-all approach does. Um, so, and what are the potential forms of, of adaptation that could be uh, delivered to make this interaction with visualizations more personalized? So one way would be, for instance, to provide personalized support to help users work with a specific visualizations, for instance, bar charts, right? So you could imagine having affordances and mechanisms that help users, that help guide users' attention when they're processing a specific visualization, okay? Another alternative could be to have a variety of alternative visualizations available to perform the same task, and the form of personalization would be try to suggest to a user the visualization that seems to be most suited for this specific for its specific needs. Okay, uh, the idea here is you know the goal of the work that we have been doing with my group is really to try to implement these forms of adaptation by you know putting them in this adaptive cycle where we do have user models that are capable of tracking properties of the users that can be relevant for adaptation, such as relevant perceptual schemes, expertise, confusion, cognitive load, and the infer them from data sources that, in this case, could be interaction events if the visualizations are interactive, but a key point is that a lot of processing of, infer of inf visualizations is done visually. So an important component, an important source of data is eye tracking. So some of the work that I'll present today will show you what we can do with eye tracking data to understand how to devise these user adaptive visualizations, okay? So, as I said here, we need to have a user model that, oops, sorry. I do have this, why I'm not using it? Um, so we have the user model, I put some properties here, but the thing is, in information visualization is definitely one of those fields because there hasn't been much work done on how users work with visualizations. It's not really clear what are the user characteristics that might impact visualization effectiveness. As I showed you, there was some initial uh, 
work done on it, but a lot of it was anecdotal, not very solid in nature. So it's really important to investigate which user characteristics impact user experience when they work with a specific target visualization, so where to that, and then also understand how these user characteristics impact performance so that we can understand how personalization could improve users' processing of visualizations and can we build models to um, predict in real time the characteristics that matter. So in general, um, so there has been already some prior work on user adaptive visualizations. It is a very new field, but there are already some results. Uh, this is mostly being done on uh, user models, so capturing user preferences over a set of available visualizations. Um, taking into account user expertise in using different types of visualizations and tracking suboptimal usage behavior. And these are interactive visualizations where what they were doing, they were creating models of how they should be used. Um, and so in the model, in the user model, what these researchers were tracking is whether, whether users were deviating from this optimal use of the interactivity that was available. Uh, so input data for creating these models, it was mostly mouse clicks and seeing which visualizations user would select a priori if they were allowed to choose among the available visualizations. And adaptation was mostly related to recommending an alternative visualization if the system decided that it was better than what the user was cur currently dealing with. Uh, the way we have been uh, extending this research include Capturing in a model uh, things that go beyond this preferences, expertise, and suboptimal user behavior, including user cognitive abilities, personalities, capturing confusion, input data. We also use processing of gaze data coming from eye tracking. And for adaptation, we want to look not only at suggesting alternative visualizations, but also finding ways to helping to help a user work with a current visualization if that's the only thing that it's available, okay? So what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna uh, show you a couple of, uh, two examples of how we apply this methodology to create user adaptive visualizations for uh, basic bar chart visualizations first. And then I'm gonna show you similar results for a more complex setting. And then I'll conclude with some discussion of research directions, okay? All right. So. Why bar well, bar chart visualizations are one of the most popular and effective visualizations, very widespread. They're known to be quite user-friendly and easy to use. Um, so much so that actually here I have a bar chart visualization that I took from a paper by uh, Schneiderman and colleagues. This paper is, on, is an overview of uh, state of the art of uh, learning um, student facing, no, no, not student facing, learning dashboards for a variety of constituencies. And this bar chart visualization shows how often different types of visualizations, bar charts, line graph, tables, so on and so forth, are used in dashboards for different constituencies. And as you can see, we have bar charts are used definitely more than others, especially for dashboards that are for teachers and students, okay? So, um, they should be straightforward to use because, as I said, they're known to be quite um, user-friendly and they're very widespread. So do we still need personalized support for bar charts? Uh, that's what we decided to investigate with the user study that I'm going to um, discuss now. And um, so specifically, we're going to go over these three steps, but specific to understanding how users work with bar graph visualizations, okay? So in this study, we had 62 participants. So our numbers are definitely not the big data numbers that the invited speaker was talking about yesterday. We don't, I don't think we have a problem of having p-values that are less than 0 0.5 because we have too many users. That's not gonna happen. Um, so it's a within subject design and uh, users were working with uh, bar graph visualizations answering uh, questions on two types of tasks of varying complexity. I'll discuss more what these tasks are. They come from um, a, cho a specific, well-established taxonomy of visualization tasks that it's often used in information visualization. 
Uh, and they were answering questions in four different domains. Uh, one of them you will see in the example is actually uh, comparing the performance of different students on different courses. So it's something that we might have, for instance, in a uh, learning dashboard, but we had no intention to design a learning dashboard here. It's just a coincidence. Um, so the study procedure, so we had the users uh, took, uh, were tested first for a variety of uh, user characteristics that we thought could be relevant for uh, how they process visualizations. Uh, then they went through this battery of visualization tasks of varying complexity, and then they took, and so from these tasks, we are actually measuring performance in terms of time that they took to answer the questions and accuracy, okay? And then they also took questionnaires on visualization preference and usability. So we collected some self-reports on their subjective evaluations of their experience with the visualizations. Um, and their gaze was tracked with this Toby 120i tracker. I'll give you more details as we go through these boxes. So in terms of user uh, characteristics, the ones that we tested include this Perceptual abilities, one is called perceptual speed. It's a measure of speed when one is performing simple uh, perceptual tasks. Visual working memory measures the capacity for storage and manipulation of visual information, including, for instance, uh, color and orientation of objects. Verbal working memory is the verbal counterpart for visual working memory, so it's uh, storage and uh, manipulation capacity for verbal information. Uh, we chose this first two because they had been shown, uh, there was anecdotal evidence that can impact visualization um, processing. Verbal working memory we added because there are verbal components in a lot of visualizations, so we just figured it would be good to have a control for that. Then we also tested this famous locus of control that has been shown by others to impact visualization processing, just to see if we could replicate the results. I had my doubts, but it's not difficult to test it, so. Um, <clears throat> and uh, all these guys, there are well-established tests in psychology to measure these abilities. And in fact, if you're interested, where we have summarized all the different user abilities that we have worked with in our studies. So if you're interested, uh, I'm not going to go through it now in detail, but for every test, it tells you if there is an uh, online uh, test, if it's on paper, how long it takes, in which publications uh, on user adaptive visualizations it has been used, and so on and so forth. So I can, I can discuss it later if you're interested. Um, and we also checked for visualization expertise, this was a self-reported measure where users rated how often they work with bar charts just to give a sense of how uh, familiar they are with this particular type of visualization. And there was quite a spread, despite the fact that obviously bar charts are so well used. Um, so then they, uh, users went through this battery of uh, uh, visualization uh, tasks including the simple one, it's what's called technical retrieve value task. Here you have, so here is an example where we have a set of uh, students uh, taking a variety of courses and the dark bar in every group, it's the average for the course. And questions on this task could be, so a retrieve value question means that just focusing on finding the specific value in the data set. So an example is, is Lindsay's grade in chemistry above the class average for that course? So you kind of have to go in chemistry and see what happens to Lindsay, the bar for Lindsay and the bar for the average. Uh, and then the user can input the answer here. The other type, more complex questions are called compute derived value uh, type and essentially users have to find values in the visualization and also do something a little bit more elaborate with that. So for instance here, one question of that type is how many courses are both Lindsay and Kylie, in how many courses are these two students above the class average? So obviously the user has to scan all the different uh, groups and just make the comparison and do their computation, okay? So this is more complex. 
And finally, the user gate, as I said, was tracked with this uh, Toby eye tracker. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to work with eye tracking, but just to show you, this is a very, it's a simple, very expensive, but very simple eye tracker that is uh, uh, mounted on uh, a monitor, completely non-invasive. So what you can see here, if this works, is this is the user where eyes are tracked, but there is no contact with, between the eye tracker and the user, and the eye tracker registers all the fixations on the screen, these red dots, how uh, long they are, and how the transitions between fixations happen. Okay. So, the data that we collected from this study is, we're gonna, we used it to look at those three uh, questions on this, these three main steps for devising user adaptive visualization. So the first one, what to adapt to. So we wanted to see which of the tested user characteristics impacts performance experience of the user that we measure, as I said before, in terms of performance in answering the questions and also their self-reported uh, satisfaction with the actual uh, visualizations. So what we found, I'm just gonna give you a sample of the results here, because it would take too long to go into too much detail, but there is more detail in the reference above if you're interested. So we found that users that have lower measures or perceptual speed, uh, visual working memory, and verbal working memory, having lower level of these measures has a negative impact on task performance when tasks get more difficult, okay? So for the easy task, retrieve value, the differences in these measures don't come into play much, but as the tasks get more complicated, then we start seeing differences, and the, these are significant interaction effects. So all the results that I'm showing, I'm not looking, showing the statistics, but they're all statistically significant, okay? Um, so this is the first implication for personalization. Users with this lower level of cognitive abilities could benefit for some support in looking at, in working with this bar graphs when tasks get harder, okay? So which type of support? This takes us to the second step in our you know, trilogy of steps. We wanna look at how to adapt by looking at how these individual differences actually impact users' behavior with the task, in this case with the visualization. Here the only behaviors are visual attention, so we're gonna try and see what is the impact of these individual differences on uh, gaze patterns that they have when they look at these visualizations, okay? So just to give you a sense of how we deal with this, uh, how we, uh, we uh, represent gaze patterns, uh, so as I said, the eye tracker gives us uh, measures of like fixations on the screen and saccades between these fixations. Uh, and so general measures that are used to have a sense of uh, visual attention include a uh, number of fixation, fixation rate, fixation duration over the whole screen, and measures also related to the length of saccades between two, between fixations, and there are also measures that are useful, that are like angles between saccades because that gives a sense of how much, uh, you know, how the user is panning uh, the visual display. So these measures can be taken over the full screen or they can also be taken on specific areas of interest in the um, visualization. In this case, our areas of interest included the top part of the bar graphs where all the information is essentially on differences, uh, the labels for the different groups, uh, the legend, the question, and the input area, okay? so. With the data that we collected, what we actually did, oh sorry, and with these measures, you just essentially have a sense of how much time the user is spe spending processing the different, the different sub areas, okay? And we use summary statistics to make features out of these measures that are essentially simple statistics such as mean and standard deviation, okay? So what we wanna see is how perceptual abilities, the, the cognitive abilities that we saw make a difference in performance with working with the visualization if they impact any of these uh, components of gaze pattern, okay? So again, the analysis and the detailed results are too uh, complicated to discuss here. I'm just gonna give you some examples. 
We found, for instance, that users with low perceptual speed that remember had lower performance on task uh, tend to spend more time processing the labels, so the names of the, the groups at the bottom of the bar graph. And uh, so they look more at those, they transition back and forth more. And this effect gets larger when tasks get more difficult, okay? So an idea for application for adaptation would be we might want to find ways to help these users with low perceptual speed process the labels better. Because this is something that might be, this is the one difference that we saw between high and low perceptual speed users, and so it might be the reason why they are slower, okay? Um, some other examples, we also found that for difficult tasks, users with low verbal working memory were spending more time processing the textual parts of the graph. This is not surprising because they have low verbal working memory. They might have more difficult with textual information. What's interesting, though, is that we could actually find <coughs> this impact from the statistical analysis that we did. The differences in patterns came out, okay? So it's detectable. And uh, low visual working memory users spend more time processing the answer input area. This is not a very intuitive result, but essentially our explanation is because they have lower ability and capacity for storing the uh, properties of the objects, in this case the bars in the graph, they might need to go back and forth more between the input area and the bars before making up their mind what and how to answer a specific question. So we still don't know exactly how to help this user, but the point is what these results show is that it, it's important the different types of users have issues with different elements of the visualization. So it would be interesting to focus on way to devise support for these users that target each specific element that is difficult for them, okay? Uh, now the final question. Can we actually predict the user, ab the abilities, this visual working memory, verbal working memory that we noticed are important, could be important for personalization. Can we detect them in real time? Uh, so now we're at this point of the trilogy of steps. Um, and the only way we can predict those is with whatever, the only data that we have available is the gaze data from the eye tracker. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, and so what we did, we did some uh, experiments where we wanted to predict, first of all, we also want to see if we can predict ta task complexity because we saw that we not easy tasks did not really require much help for any users because they all did the same on those tasks. But it's important to possibly provide adaptation when the tasks are hard. So can we predict from gaze data if a user is working on an easier or more complex task? And also, can we predict these cognitive abilities? So in this case, we make the classification task binary by splitting users in high and low levels of the three uh, perceptual speed, visual working memory, verbal working memory, using median split for the measures that come out of the tests that we gave them. These are continuous measures. Um, and so we built, I won't go again into the details of the machine learning, but essentially here we use a simple, logist uh, simple logistic class regression from Weka, so like a super simple classifier out of the box, so nothing fancy. Uh, but what we did, what we want to see is how early during the interaction can, if at all, a classifier built on gaze data predict these abilities, okay? So in order to do that, we simulated giving we build classifiers for different incremental percentages of data from the beginning of the interaction. So classifier after seeing 10% of the gaze data, 20% and so on and so forth, okay? And to see how that goes. So what I'm gonna show you next is graphs that show how the evolution, sorry, the accuracy of these classifiers evolve over time based on how much data they see, okay? And uh, we we'll always do a comparison with a majority classifier that just predicts the majority class for the data set. And so uh, this is the graph for task complexity. The baseline is the whatever color, beige um, line. And the darker one is the classifier. And so uh, the gaze-based classifier has accuracy that is statistically significantly higher than uh, the baseline. This is uh, accuracy averaged over tenfold cross-validated experiments. 
And uh, it's interesting to see that, I don't really know why this thing is not showing, but um, it's interesting to see that the accuracy is quite high already, quite early on during the interaction. So the gaze is already, the patterns are already different very early on when they're looking at different tasks, at, at tasks with uh, different difficulty. And then, of course, the more gaze data you get, the higher uh, the accuracy goes. Okay, but it's interesting to see that this prediction can be done quite early on during the interaction. These are the results for the cognitive abilities, uh, perceptual speed, visual working memory, and verbal working memory. And the gaze-based classifiers can still be the baseline. The accuracies in terms of sheer numbers are not as high as visualization, um, sorry, as task complexity. Um, but they're still much better than the baseline. Um, as it's interesting to see that ha the peak of the accuracy or values for visual working memory that is like within a small percentage of the peak are already happening, are happening about 50%, we're seeing 50% of the data. So it is possible to do this prediction quite early on during the interaction. And it's interesting to see that classifiers for some of these actually get more confused if they get more data. And that's probably because those perceptual abilities come into play at the beginning when you're trying to set up the visual scene and do your initial processing and then other things come into play that probably sort of uh, start watering down the information that you can get from the gaze related to perceptual abilities. Um, I'm gonna skip this for now, but if you're interested, I can talk about it. Um, so, summary of results so far. So we confirmed that individual differences matter even when we're dealing with simple visualizations based on bar graphs. Uh, I also showed that it is possible, so um, these differences uh, impact attention patterns uh, on different elements of the bar graph depending on the different user characteristics. And this suggests to investigate personalization that target these different elements for the different user types. And also shown some evidence that eye tracking is an encouraging, a promising source of data to build these classifiers, okay? I should say that we actually, this is not the only study that we ran with bar graph based visualizations. We had a few others that I won't have time to go through, but we obtained quite similar results with uh, these other studies showing that what we have seems to be a quite reliable set of results for this specific visualizations. However, to be fair, all these results were uh, generated with um, tasks, lab-based, right, where users were engaging in quite uh, fictitious tasks. They were ask, ask, answering the questions of the type that I showed you earlier, quite disconnected from their own um, actual uh, interest and reality, okay? So we wanted to see if we could actually step this work up a little bit and start looking at if our results actually generalize to more complex setting. By that I mean looking at other visualizations, in this particular case, maps and deviation charts, and I'll explain what they are in a bit. Uh, we also wanted to see what happens if these visualizations become more interactive, which the ones that we used before were not, um, and uh, have more realistic tasks, okay, that are tasks that are actually more interesting for the users, okay? Uh, and so to do that, we looked at, uh, we did some work with a company in Vancouver that has developed this commercial application, it's called MetroQuest. This is a visual, uh, it's a platform to, uh, support, it's for decision support, and it's mostly used by policy maker to provide um, interfaces that allow to show um, problems related to environmental policies. Uh, to the public, to in, in engage the public in understanding these problems and uh, participating and providing their feedback, okay? Um, so, I'm gonna show you a version of MetroQuest that um, it's, uh, so I want to say MetroQuest is used again in very, um, 
a company sells it for situations where, again, a constituency wants to engage the public in a specific problem, so they create, they go to ex expos or um, variety of events where you could put up a kiosk and have your MetroQuest interface open to the public to explore a specific issue. So we developed one that it's uh, for a problem of building three transit scenarios to uh, the commute to the UBC campus in Vancouver. This is a project that the city has been dealing with forever. They, they, they're not able, they, they're not making up their minds because there's a lot of controversy on which solution is the best, or there are three different alternative scenarios. And uh, so this is a project that has been, you know, like uh, the focus of the news and the UBC community, it's very much a part of the problem and is very interested in the problem. And so we developed this interface using data that it's actually published by, published by the city. And I'm gonna show you a little clip of what this system is about. The MetroQuest interface is designed to guide the user through the process of learning and comparing three proposed transit scenarios in the city of Vancouver. Screen one, welcomes the user and provides background information about the overall transit project. Screen two helps users select and prioritize which indicators will be used to compare the different transit scenarios. Here, the user selects travel time savings and cost as two of the indicators they feel are important. Screen three allows the user to learn about each transit scenario using two different visualizations. First, on the right, a deviation chart shows a visual summary of the values of all the indicators. The prioritized indicators selected during screen two are displayed at the top. A green arrow indicates that travel time savings will be improved, whereas the red arrow indicates that cost will get worse. Second, a map on the bottom shows the proposed transit route. The indicators are also plotted on the map. For instance, Travel time savings are shown as numerical values at various stops along the way. In practice, the user can compare the three scenarios by switching among the three tabs shown at the top. The user can also provide a rating out of five stars for each scenario. Okay, um, so I wanted to show this work because obviously, I mean, it doesn't have any you know, resemblance to anything that could be used for education at the moment, right? But there are some things that I, I think uh, there are issues that exist with this application that could be, uh, might as well come up when you design, for instance, a dashboard, okay? Because what happens here, for instance, is that um, designing effective and engaging visualizations for MetroQuest is challenging because uh, these visualizations are supposed to be seen and understood by a large diversity, by a large variety of population of users. Because, as I said before, that could be you know, like something like this could be put up by the city of Vancouver in some sort of a kiosk just to increase awareness uh, in the public about this problem. Right? Anybody could go and just play with the system. It's really a walk up and use kind of interface and try to understand the implications of the three different scenarios. Uh, so it can be users, you know, there are all, all those sorts of types and they won't have much time. They, they will go look at the system, play with it, and maybe never look at it again. Uh, but it's actually what needs to be visualized is quite complex. There are all these factors and you wanna see how the different measures for these factors change with the different scenarios. You have to compare them. Uh, so the, um, developer of the system, MetroQuest, there are visualization experts, there are HCI experts. MetroQuest has been uh, evaluated uh, with all the good uh, uh, evaluation HCI criteria. It's very popular if you go and uh, uh, Google MetroQuest, you'll see all the, all the customers that they have. But the developers, the MetroQuest people came to us because they still feel that there are users who when they're faced with the system, are confused. These visualizations are complicated, it's too much for them, comparing across screen, what can we do, right? For some users, the complexity that is there is fine, and it actually shows the richness of the data, but for others, it's too much. And this is the best that they could do what, uh, up to now, and again, it is 
a good design, but it could be improved by allowing the system to generate something simpler for those users who might be overwhelmed, for instance, by the information as it is presented here, okay? Um, and uh, so how could we, it's especially personalizing and making it easier for those users that might need it. Um, so we ran a study, which has more users than before, 166, uh, to investigate a battery of 10 user characteristics that might impact uh, performance with MetroQuest and then to go through the other steps to see if we can create a form of user adaptive interaction for this particular application, okay? Um, so I won't show you, I, I won't discuss all the different abilities that we tested. I can go back to it if you're interested. Um, in terms of participants, we actually took participants from the UBC community. So these are, you know, obviously students who study there, but there is also a very large residential area. So there were people who live on, in, on campus and don't work on campus. So we had a very large uh, variety of users from students to even uh, senior citizens. Uh, Gaze was, uh, again, tracked with the Toby 10320 eye tracker. The uh, participants worked and used MetroQuest as they would if they were in a kiosk. So we asked them to just sit down and play with the system and try to make up their mind about the three scenarios. We didn't give them any training on MetroQuest because that's the way it would be used in, uh, in real settings. So it's still a lab study. We couldn't do it in the wild because we needed to track their gaze with the eye tracker, okay? But it's as we, we put a lot of effort into trying to make this more realistic and more interesting for the user, for you know, engaging them in a task that they could care about. Um, so when they finished uh, working with MetroQuest, they completed a questionnaire on their experience with the system. So usefulness for each visualization, which you know, preference on which one they preferred and also a measure of their confidence in the ratings that they generated on the different scenarios at the end. One thing that I wanna point out is that because that we couldn't get any objective quantitative performance measure here, because there is not really clear task that they have to do. They just have to decide what they like and which scenario they prefer, okay? So in this case, our measures of performance relate to their usefulness for visualization preferences and this measure of decision confidence plus something else that is described in the paper but I won't have time to go into detail about. Um, so, and here, of the different user characteristics that we tested, there were 10 of them, uh, five we found impact on the user experience with MetroQuest. So the three, the first three, perceptual speed, visual working memory, verbal working memory are the same that I showed you before for the bar task visualizations. And we have two more that came up. And these are specific uh, characteristics that we put in because the literature in uh, psychology shows that they are relevant for map processing, okay? So one is called spatial memory and it's the measure for one's capacity to store and manipulate spatial arrangements of objects, and visual scanning is a speed when, when locating objects in relevant surroundings, okay? Um, and again, you can see all the definitions and all the tests in that link that I gave you earlier. Um, uh, some of the results, again, I won't be able to list all the results, but to give you a sense here, some of the results that we found uh, included the fact that low um, spatial uh, memory, SP, SM, <laughs> SP? low spatial memory users uh, found charts less useful. They didn't like them as much as the high um, spatial memory users counterparts. And high visual working memory users preferred the charts over the map, okay? Probably because they're, remember visual memory is processing sh uh, properties such as color and shape. And the chart, it's really good about that because it has those arrows that change shape and uh, the color has a precise meaning. So they had that preference. 
So once again, we find that there is an impact of individual differences and we could think of providing personalized support based on this finding. Now, what kind of personalization we could consider? For instance, for low spatial memory users who didn't find uh, the charts as useful, we could consider making changes, adaptive changes to the charts. For instance, we could consider showing fewer factors. We remember there are seven factors that are shown, uh, but some of these factors are users rank them in terms of importance, so we could just show fewer factors for those that perhaps find uh, seven to be too high and too cluttered. Um, add visual cues for these users to process this visual, this chart. We don't know for sure because we haven't done, if you notice, the second step of analyzing how this uh, low spatial working memory impacts gaze pattern. So it's a step that we haven't taken yet in this particular work, but it's something that we can do with the data that we have available. Another option would be, for instance, uh, uh, allowing, uh, providing a mechanism for them to actually hide the visualization if they don't like it, okay? Same for high visual work visual working memory users who didn't appreciate the maps as much. So there could be adaptive interventions to make a map more bearable for them. For instance, show simpler maps. But again, even here, we would need to do a more detailed analysis of what are the actual difficulties that these users find with the map. And again, we haven't done it yet. Uh, or allow for hiding the maps. That's another possibility, okay? Um, in the meanwhile, though, can these abilities be predicted in real time during interaction? Because we still want to see if that's possible, otherwise there is no user modeling that can happen, okay? So similar to the experiment that we ran before here, we also ran, uh, we turned these abilities, these five abilities that we found had an impact on processing of these uh, visualizations in MetroQuest, split them into higher low levels of these five cognitive abilities, and um, for this particular work, we used information from the eye tracker that is not just the gaze, but we could also use pupil information because we, so the eye tracker also gives changes in pupil diameter that it's a very interesting measure that can be related to cognitive load and other um, processing um, measures. And also gives information on head distance from the screen which is also something that could uh, show if a user is more or less interested and engaged with the task. Uh, the gaze was tracked over four different areas of interest here. And we trained, in this case, was a random forest classifiers. Again, I will not go into the details of the machine learning, but it's in that paper if you're interested. Um, trained on 10 floral cross validation over users. And uh, just some summary of the results. We could predict, using these gaze-based classifiers, we could predict four out of the five cognitive abilities. So we couldn't predict verbal working memory. I guess there are not, the differences in the patterns are not strong enough for the predict for the classifier to pick them up. But the other ones are um, still predictable and they are significantly more accurate than the uh, baseline classifier. And as before, we can see that best accuracy is observed within looking at, you know, the, the classifier needs to see between 10 and 50% of the interaction data in order to achieve its peak accuracy, okay? So um, this is similar to what we saw before where towards the end of the interaction, getting more data doesn't really help the classifier at that point, okay? But it's important for knowing that we can pro possibly consider providing adaptation quite early on during the interaction, which is what you want to do to provide help, okay? I'm gonna skip this. It's related to processing gaze data. You, you can ask me if there is, uh, if you, there is interest and in time. But um, what ne what's next? Uh, so first of all, for sure, we could uh, track lower levels of the relevant user abilities and try to provide suitable interventions by doing a little bit of a more detailed analysis of gaze patterns and why, where these users would need help. Um, or we could like 
generate support that is just suggesting to spatial memory users to hide the chart and to hide visual working memory users to hide the map. But we could also try, and my, my, I mean, this is probably something that you have been thinking about as I've been talking, instead of providing, letting the system provide the adaptation, what about designing mechanisms for the user to customize? Why not? I mean, users should know better, right? So, for instance, we could design tools for allow users to customize. For instance, choose themselves. They should be able to choose whether to, for instance, hide the map and hide the chart, okay? If they don't like it. So, in fact, uh, we wanted to see that because in all work, uh, the next step of after the first three <laughs> that I discussed when you want to create user adaptive interfaces is really understand how to actually deliver the adaptation because that can be really difficult, okay? This field for a long time was not, in, was sort of like looked upon with a bit of suspicion from HCI people because, you know, adaptation could be happening behind your back. There have been some very bad adaptive systems that were built where the user was like, what is going on? why they're like, things are disappearing on me, and that is definitely some issues that could ad exist with adaptive systems. So how to provide adaptation, it's a very important point of or aspect of this research. Uh, and one should always try and see what about customization? Let's see what happens if I just let the user choose first, right? So what we did, we generated, a, we ran a study with 46 participants and with this version of MetroQuest where they could actually um, use and um, hide the map or hide the chart and bring them back as they wanted. I, sorry, I don't have the link there, but you can play with this uh, version if you're interested. This is very simple. You just hide uh, or bring back each of the th visualizations. Um, this is very fresh data, so I, won't have, uh, I, I don't have any polished slide to show it. I can definitely give you some more information if you're interested. Uh, but essentially what we found is that um, only 15 out of the 46 users customized, okay? And this is not a unique result. There's been a lot of work on uh, trying customization and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And it's not because here only a few users, I don't remember, I think three or four, said that they were not aware of the customization mechanism or they didn't understand how it worked, although it's kind of hard to believe. but. Um, the others just said, no, nah, I, didn't, I didn't care to customize. I was okay having the two visualizations. And uh, however, we also have data showing that for the users who did not customize, they would have done better if they did, okay? And even some of those who customized, they would have done better if they didn't. And I can go into the details. There is a complex analysis that also has individual differences into the picture. But the story is, um, it's nice to have mechanisms to customize, but there might always be the need for a little bit of system-driven support provided, okay? It can help the users customize, especially those users who don't do it because they're you know, lazy or not confident or they don't understand and so on and so forth. Um, so this is sort of like uh, the end, and I just wanna kind of uh, wrap up by reiterating that uh, visualizations are becoming more and more prominent in our daily lives. Uh, there is huge potential, I hope I've convinced you that there is huge potential for personalization. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that user adaptive techniques can help, my help. Um, and there's a lot of exciting work ahead with the idea of providing effective mixed initiative support. So when I say mixed initiative support, that means having the system being able to understand how to provide adaptive intervention to the users, but also having the user in the loop to be able to decide whether or not, for instance, to accept the system suggestions or to possibly um, just reject them and have a little bit of a dialogue going on between the user and the system where essentially we are in between customization and system-driven adaptation, okay? And it would be awesome, this is very initial research, just scratch the surface of can, what can be done in this field. So for me, it would be 
you know, the main goal is to generalize what we've done to other visualizations, tasks, users. For instance, if any of you would like to be doing some of this work applied to learning dashboards, open learner models, I think it would be a, you know, a lot of potential for interesting, interesting results. Um, so just really quick, if uh, um, to bring maybe if someone wants to come to the uh, session afterwards or sort of like work that we have been doing on, uh, for instance, along the lines on how to provide mixed initiative support. We have been doing some work on testing um, highlighting interventions on bar graph and how they can provide it in an adaptive manner, and also on predicting user confusion, which would be if you predict that the user is confused at any given point during interaction, that's a good time to provide adaptation. And we're also working on uh, uh, transferring and generalizing some of the work that we have done on pure visualization to situations where we have narrative visualization. So there is text and graphics. And uh, I think I'm gonna finish here. Oops, go back. And I wanna thank all the people who have done amazing work here. The first two are professors, but all the people in Boulder, the students or postdoc, and they've done really an amazing work. Unfortunately, I wasn't organized enough to have pictures up, but uh, they're still great. And I also want to thank you for inviting me and for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Christina, for the amazing keynote. We all enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, um, so we have uh, seven minutes for questions. And um, you're welcome to ask your questions. I'm interested if you've done any work in terms of the map use in MetroQuest and how users customise it using the zoom and focus functions. Because to me that seems like something we all customise on a daily basis without realising that we're customising it for ourselves. Because if we had lower uh, visual working memory, for example, we might tend to focus in on certain parts. So have you done any work on that customization? Not at all, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic idea and it's definitely something that we would like to try. So we definitely just started with the simplest form of, of customization that we could think of. Also, we don't have a lot of uh, freedom in how we can, it's not an open um, source system. So unfortunately, any change is painful. So this is an easy enough one. But, uh, but what you're suggesting is great. Actually, it's, it's something else that we could definitely try. Because that's also what we want to do. We want to try different types of customization to see how the results that we got here generalized to other ways to customize. Uh, to really understand that, well, you know, what is the tipping point for users to you know, be doing the work themselves or needing a little bit of a push from the system. Mm -hmm. But that's definitely something. Thanks for the suggestion. It's a great suggestion. Yeah. Uh, when you showed Lindsay in the chemistry question, you later came back to it and put the double arrow showing here's Lindsay's bar and here's the average bar. Do the individual differences you're observing um, disappear from the predictions or the classifiers when you do something like that? If I put those, uh, if I put the, the actual um, prompts, you're saying? Yes, the visual, visual prompts, in other words, gu guide the perceptual attention to a particular area of interest. So, um, so yes, you're, it's interesting because in the study that I, I mentioned briefly towards the end, we actually tried these interventions and we tried for individual differences. And uh, so in terms of performance, if I re recall correctly, co correctly, having the interventions helped in general, but it was not depending on individual differences. They were just preferences. It was not objective performance, but there were preferences that different users had over the different uh, types of interventions. So having those interventions do help, yeah. Uh, if I could just make one little plug for finding from learning science here. 
Uh, those in the field of education will have heard lots about learning styles over the last decades. And the issue about preferences is one that's quite interesting because what the literature in the learning style shows, for instance, is that people who have a visual preference over a textual preference don't pay attention to the visualizations more than the text. They don't have the kinds of abilities that you're describing that differentiate them from people who say they prefer text. And they don't score any differently on various measures of problem solving or comprehension. So the question about whether visual, or rather preferences is the way to go when thinking about visualizations, at least standing on that literature, is one that you might think about, maybe we should ignore what people think they like. Actually, it's, it's a very good point, and we always try to test for both preferences and actual performance, uh, especially to see if there is consistency between what they prefer and what they actually do. Right, so it, it's a great point. We're, all, we're aware that preferences are not necessarily um, reliable, and in fact, that's one of the issues with customization. Right, sometimes users customize based on what they prefer, but not in terms of what is good for them. And the results that I have on this customization study it kind of shows that a little bit. I have data, but again, I can discuss it later. Um, but yes, in that case, you're right. I mean, they, they were preferring certain interventions, but there was no difference in performance. So what do you do with these preferences? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> so if they don't contradict performance, then I guess you can just indulge the user and say, well, you know, it doesn't matter to what, you know, in terms of what you do, but if you prefer this, I can give it to you, right? So you can see I'm that. I'm for way. indulgence. Yes. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, uh, I apologize for that, but uh, we will have another session at 10.30 uh, for questions and answers with Christina, so you're welcome to join that. Thank you, everyone.